Thank you everyone for being here today. Uh, we want to formally and with great respect acknowledge that we're on the traditional lands of the Yukuts Nation. Our campus, Stanislaus State, is built on the unceded ancestral lands of these indigenous tribes. Thank you for letting us honor them and give our thanks to their ancestors and descendants for their constant and careful stewardship of this land. And I'm really pleased to introduce uh, Michael Nannery and Kiyomi Fuki Nannery. Um, Michael is an interdisciplinary artist, printmaker, and curator. He is the master gardener and fabricator at Peely Press and Micro Farm. Oops. Uh, his practice spans widely from traditional two-dimensional prints, collaborative partnerships to conceptual works and installations such as public interventions and lectures of aquaponic systems. Uh, his, no his most notable projects include Herb Spiral, a botanical installation at Torrance Art Museum, dirt making and compost platform installation at Irvine Fine Arts Center, fountain aquaponics installation at Grand Central Art Center. Kiyomi's practice often deals with personal narratives and history, exploring emotional internal landscapes of trauma and process of healing. In addition to producing print-based artworks, her works often involve participatory, participatory performance and fiber arts such as tatting and natural dye. Her recent exhibitions include Seeds of Contemplation at Bola University, La Miranda, California, Poetics of Relation at DAC Gallery in Los Angeles, California, and Conversations on Conflict, Painting and Sculpture Outpost in Marysville, California, as well as the Flux Art Space in Long Beach, California. And since 2014, Michael and Kiyomi uh, have been cultivating the idea for Peace Lily Press and Micro Farm, a place that acts as a cross-section of life and art, a place to grow food and materials for creating art and functional objects, and a platform to connect with fellow humans. Today, their collaborative project, Peace Lily Press and Micro Farm, offers a micro-residency and a project exhibition space to artists on an invitation-only basis. It's a space to explore a variety of sustainable practices across gardening, organic food production, printmaking, and natural dyeing. And this list is ever expanding. And so without further ado, I'll let you two take on over. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Thanks for being here, everybody. Um, so yeah, nice to see you all there. Um, so yeah, you know, we're both artists and we also have this collaborative project. And we're also married as well. Um, we met here at, at CSULB. We both got our uh, masters of fine arts here studying in printmaking and we're actually in the same classroom where we had our first class together I know uh, so it's kind of like interesting <laughs> and fun in that sort of way mm -hmm. um, but yeah you know we both have like a printmaking background but we do work which you know you'll see is <laughs> depending on how you think about it may or may not be printmaking and may or may not be within the realm of like fine art you know so I think we both kind of like to sort of challenge those conceptions and those norms in terms of what art can be and what it can do. Uh, and we we make a lot of work that is, you know, um, you know, works in a kind of social dynamic. Um, so I think we're going to be talking a lot about projects that touch on that. Like we both make a lot of different kinds of work in our own right. And we could easily each talk for well over an hour, maybe a couple hours each. Uh, but I, we're just going to each talk about a few projects. And then we'll talk about Peace Lily Press and Micro Farm, which we've been developing together. Um, but I think I'm going first. Um, so I'm just going to go ahead and <laughs> uh, share a screen and, and present here just a few projects of mine. OK. Do a, I know the shortcut, it's just this. Thanks. Yeah. Cool. So uh, anyway, yeah, uh, this is me uh, picking some vegetables in our garden at Peace Lily Press and Micro Farm. So yeah, I've been pretty into gardening uh, for, you know, the last like eight years, I guess. And uh, yeah, it's been a really interesting and fun sort of thing to be into. I feel like I'm always learning and I'm always kind of growing. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I just enjoy the whole the whole process. So that kind of inspires a lot of the projects that I'm going to be talking about here today on my part. Um, which, yeah, you know, graduating from CSULB, um, 
you know, I, I did this thesis show when I was here called Aquariums, which doesn't really sound too printmaking related, um, which, hey, you know, the way I thought about it is like, you know, I was thinking a lot about um, fish keeping, ornamental fish keeping, like the aquarium hobby, and thinking a lot about how that kind of connects to different aspects of uh, fine art or just art making in general. Um, so I did this whole project that was kind of like expanding upon, you know, what if aquariums were art, you know, how would we think about them? How do we conceptualize aspects of the fish keeping hobby and what can we learn from that? Um, so that project was kind of exploring like markets, aesthetics, genetics, and just a wide variety of topics that are tangential to uh, like fish keeping and art and kind of where they connect. And I think in general, like a lot of my artwork, um, I'm really interested in pushing those buttons uh, of things that, you know, seem artistic or definitely require artistic input of some sort, but then are also uh, maybe not considered fine art. Uh, and I think the context and interpretation of the work is, is kind of uh, up for debate, right? And, and to me, that's really interesting. I really like that. Uh, so this was an installation I did uh, after graduating at the Palo Verde Art Center uh, up in Ranchos Palo Verde uh, here in Southern California. And uh, basically it's like an installation dedicated to Marimo moss balls. I don't know if you're familiar with these moss balls, uh, but uh, basically they're little balls of algae. Uh, that They're pretty popular in like the aquarium hobby, of course, which is what this piece is kind of connected to. But uh, definitely for a while, like maybe around 2014, 2015, something like that. They were definitely really popular as like pet that you could kind of take with you almost. And, you know, taking care of your algae ball, like, you know, you have to pat it and pack it to make sure it keeps a spherical shape. Uh, and just, you know, being like kind of interested and invested in that whole um, hobby and practice. And uh, yeah, in nature, you know, they form these spherical balls by basically bouncing around on the bottoms of these uh, northern hemisphere, very cold lakes. Uh, there is a lake in Japan, for instance, that these uh, balls are very famous for. And there's all kinds of, you know, interesting aspects to them, like people would poach them. And, uh, you know, now they're, they're very common in the like aquarium trade and practice. And uh, basically like with this installation, just kind of exploring the aesthetics of that. Uh, there were also some fish in here too. So that's like a little guppy. Um, so basically they're in these little fish bowls that were fabricated by an artist friend of mine, Manny Krakowski. And uh, all of these little balls were kind of uh, in this, you know, pro light projection kind of installation. And to me, I almost thought of it as like, here's this strange, like weird temple to these Marimo balls. And uh, there was also, you know, kind of an artist statement explaining, uh, you know, where these balls came from and, and what their meaning was. Uh, I also gave away a ton of Marimo balls at the reception. Uh, so I just had this huge jar full of all these algae balls and I was just like giving them to people. <laughs> Um, so that I think that was kind of part of the work. And I, I think a lot of these projects, I, I have like an active role in them and I'm connected to them in a way. Um, but yeah, basically it was kind of an immersive installation that you could go into and kind of interact with. So I think like the light and the shadows and the shapes were all kind of playing together uh, as one. So here's another project that I did at the Irvine Fine Arts Center. Um, there was an exhibition called Land, which was curated by Yevgenia Michalik. And uh, one of the projects I did for that was basically like this little pile of compost. So at the time I was composting quite a lot and I still do, I compost everything, all organic material, it's all compostable. Uh, I was composting a bunch of material in my driveway at home, which, uh, I actually got in trouble for because like uh, apparently somebody saw it and didn't like it and reported me to the city and <laughs> my landlord kind of got mad at me in that sort of way. Uh, but after that, I took all that compost and I, you know, used a portion of it in this exhibition and just kind of set it up, built a little platform for it. And in a way, I was almost thinking about it as like a painting or a sculpture of some sort and basically just making this little pedestal to then display 
this compost, which I mean, I think compost is just such an interesting thing. I could easily talk for an hour about compost and how interesting it is and how interesting soil life is. Uh, but, you know, in this case, I, I just saw like this kind of uh, empty, well, it wasn't an empty courtyard, this courtyard in this fine arts center. And I just wanted to kind of uh, show the compost for what it is in that space, uh, which, you know, funny enough, I, I think one of the most interesting things that happened with this work is uh, during the reception, there was like a bunch of kids that I saw kind of playing in this courtyard. And then like, I'm like, oh, that's interesting. And I go out there and I'm looking at the, the pile of compost. And then all of a sudden I see like I just hear a yell and then this kid just runs up and he jumps into the pile of com compost and compost just goes everywhere. Uh, and I was kind of like a little shocked. And I'm like, oh man, like they're kind of jumping in my installation. But then again, I also thought like, hey, you know, if, if kids are like rolling around in the dirt in my art, then um, maybe that's actually a successful artwork. Because I think, you know, kids don't get to play around in the dirt quite like this especially in the city of Irvine, which is kind of very well known for being like a manicured, maintained kind of community. So I was glad I could bring some dirt and some muck to their community uh, by bringing this project. But it was a temporal work because over time, the compost, uh, you know, it would break down and it would kind of shrink. And, um, you know, this is more towards the end of the show, like it's kind of broken down significantly. And uh, there's actually like a lot of sprouts coming out of it. And uh, in the end, I actually used this compost uh, and added it into like the different container gardens that were around the Irvine Fine Arts Center. So it actually ended up kind of fueling the plants at the Fine Arts Center and basically just helping to grow more food and herbs and vegetables, which they actually had like a cool little garden there. So like all this compost, you know, ended up kind of feeding those uh, as time moved on. Another project in that same show was about this tree. Uh, so basically there was this tree growing inside the Irvine Fine Arts Center. And, you know, I kept asking staff members there, I would ask them like, how did it get here? Uh, you know, how old is it? What's the deal with it? And nobody could tell me anything about it. Nobody knew like if it was planted or what, what was it there? Like what the deal was. Uh, it was like very neglected creature. And, uh, you know, I decided to do a project that was all about just taking care of this tree during the duration of the show. So I ended up uh, installing like a grow light above the tree itself. Um, it's not pictured here, but I, you know, uh, really trimmed it back significantly. And uh, there were also an infestation of mealybugs on it. And I, I cleaned all of that off. And I also fertilized it quite heavily as well. So basically kind of gave it a, a new lease on life and, and just took care of it really for the, the couple months that the show was open. I, I would go like, I think every other week and, and, you know, clean the leaves and fertilize it and take care of it and basically just bring attention to this plant that was in the space and, and kind of like celebrate it in a way. Um, so, you know, moving on, like uh, another project I did kind of around that time, this was like around 2017, uh, I did this major project. This is probably like the biggest art project I've done. Uh, it's, it's called The Fountain, and it was at Grand Central Art Center in Santa Ana. So this is actually right downtown in Santa Ana. And uh, this is an aquaponics system. So if you're not familiar with aquaponics, it's basically, it's, it's kind of like hydroponics where you're growing plants in like a soilless medium. Uh, but basically, instead of um, like, you know, chemicals in the water, you're actually using fish and aquatic life to produce waste, which then is pumped up into the grow beds and then used by the plants. Um, so basically, it's a recirculating system. You know, I can't, I think there was probably around like 300 gallons of water or something like that kind of moving through the system. And this project ran for an entire year. So this is actually kind of at the start, maybe like less than a month into it. Uh, and we use these expanded clay pellets, hydroton, and uh, basically that's kind of like the medium that the plants were growing in. And, um, you know, there were also two tanks. So basically a lot of goldfish, a lot of minnows and crawdads and snails were the primary inhabitants of this tank. These kinds of systems, a lot of people grow like tilapia or trout or other kinds of edible fish in them. Uh, in this case, I just grew ornamental fish. Uh, 
I mean, you definitely could have eaten the crawdads. Uh, I can't because I'm allergic to shellfish, but it, you know, you could you could eat them if you wanted to. Uh, I actually still have the system running at at our current house, and uh, I, I put some baby tilapia in there, so they're starting to grow. So, you know, maybe in a few months we will get to eat some fish out of this system. Um, but yeah, basically, like this. Um, you know, aquaponic garden, you know, in addition to being viewable inside the gallery in like the Grand Central Art Center Education Gallery, it was also viewable from the street. And, uh, you know, basically just people walking by could just look into it and see all these crazy plants growing, which I should mention, they were all edible or medicinal plants. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, every month there was like a different iteration of this project where either myself or an artist would come in and um, do a special project uh, expanding upon the aquaponic system. So this was kind of a platform project in which, you know, the, the basic aspect of it was this aquaponic garden, but then every month there would be a different interpretation of it. So like one month I did a, you know, worm composting session, uh, another month we made salad like little salad shooters out of all these <laughs> different ingredients here. Um, in another month, Kiyomi did a special project with one of the ones that she'll talk about in her part. Um, so all different way interpretations of it. And, you know, you might consider aquaponics to not be art, to not be fine art. But then in this context, I was kind of interpreting it as a platform for, uh, or a vehicle for art to be formed or artistic situations to happen. And uh, the art walks there, you know, quite a lot of people would come through, you know, at least several hundred people. Um, so, you know, all sorts of people from the community would be coming through and checking it out. And I, I think some of my favorite stuff was when like, you know, a little kid would come in and he'd be, they'd be explaining to their parents what all was happening with the aquaponics or the composting or whatever. Uh, and it, it kind of really became a way for just people in the community to almost educate the, each other or just to really be inspired by some interesting uh, interpretation of, you know, gardening and, and growing. Uh, but yeah, basically, you know, from the outside, you know, looking in, it's just these very bright pink lights, uh, especially at night is incredibly bright. And it, it almost looked like a spaceship landed in downtown Santa Ana. And it was basically this very bright pink fixture for an entire year. Um, so yeah, it was a really cool way to connect to the community and, you know, just doing the project, you know, I would, I would, you know, oftentimes meet with and talk to all the people in, in that area. And that was very enjoyable. Uh, but yeah, this is kind of what it looked like at night. And uh, as the pro project went on, there would be, you know, more and more added to it. So you can kind of see that there's like some ceramic artwork kind of mixed in. And that was based off of one of the monthly iterations of this project. Uh, you can kind of see that there's sort of these painted wood paneling along the side. And um, that was after the first month, the first like art walk is like I invited the community to come in and basically paint onto little segments of, of this paneling. And that eventually kind of became the decoration for the project itself. So in a way, I was thinking about crowdsourcing the aesthetics. Uh, of course, I had control over <laughs> the general form, uh, but they added all their interesting little like paintings and, you know, uh, yeah, whatever they would add, it was kind of an, an open, open forum for them. Uh, but yeah, all the all the food was really delicious. I still I remember how good it was, and you know many of these like onions actually survived for three or four years beyond this because after the show happened, it, the system went to live in my friend's backyard, and it stayed there for about two and a half years before I eventually took it back. And um, yeah, I think you know some of those plants really just kind of kept on going, and the system just kept going. Um, and those monthly iterations, you know, so. Um, yeah, it was, they were all like very interesting in their own sort of way. And, and this is a photo of, of the last iteration, which we kind of did this special audio visual kind of performance, uh, which, you know, um, myself and a couple other friends, uh, kind of did like a musical performance, um, that evening and another friend kind of added some mirrors and some lights to it to kind of, uh, basically those kind of sort of, uh, 
little marks on the wall or lights on the wall, those are from the grow lights themselves being reflected onto the wall. So even though it looks pink, it's actually red lights and blue lights. And I see a couple of green lights there too. Um, so those combine to make that pink color. And that, that pink color, it's kind of like an ideal uh, light color for the plants to absorb because it's both those red and the blue light spectrums. Uh, but yeah, we did this musical performance uh, that last night, and that, that was like a really fun way to kind of cap off that project. There was even like some kid who I remember seeing him there like a few months previously, and he joined us and played for like, I don't know, five minutes or something like that. Um, so yeah, moving on to other projects, um, you know, sometime after that, I did another project, uh, and this was the herb spiral, uh, which this one was at, um, the Torrance Art Museum. And, uh, this was part of, a an exhibition that I was curated into. And, uh, you know, the herb spiral, it took some inspiration from a few different things. There actually are these herb spiral gardens that people do where they're kind of like an herb garden kind of grown in a spiral sort of form. So it was kind of inspired by that. Uh, I think also the Robert Smithson spiral jetty piece was, you know, of course, an obvious inspiration there too. Um, and yeah, you know, just the making of it, you know, for some reason, I thought the laying out of the paper towels was almost as interesting as the work itself. I don't know why, I just really liked it. Uh, but basically, I collected all these herbs uh, and also plant material out of my garden and, um, you know, many of my friends' gardens and some places where I take some walks in the neighborhood and kind of laid them out in a spiral shape. And um, it had a very, very strong aroma. Mm -hmm. So all those herbs and plant materials were all basically just kind of evaporating in the space. And this is kind of like a functional art project where the purpose was to actually just dry all of these herbs, uh, but to do it in a very meaningful arrangement. And uh, it smelled incredibly strongly in that space, especially you know the day and the few days after I did it, to the point to where um, the administrators at that museum were like very afraid that uh, like somebody would have like some sort of reaction to it. And they made this sign that was like, caution, you might have an allergic reaction to this installation, you know, be careful, <laughs> which was kind of like a little strange where we're, we're afraid of the natural world to that point. Like we're afraid of, of plants smells, you know? So um, I, I felt like that was a really fun experiment to where like the institutional uh, situation was basically afraid of some plant material in their gallery. And maybe they were right to be afraid, right? So, um, you know, the whole purpose of it, like I said, was to dry it out. So it did dry out as intended. And, um, you know, by the end of the show, it was just a bunch of dry herbs and plant material in the gallery. And uh, at the closing reception, I invited people to come through and then take material home and to, you know, use it, cook with it, make tea out of it, whatever, because it was basically all edible and that was part of the intention, or at least the majority of it was. And some of it could even be replanted, like these uh, cactus pads, for instance, were still good to use. Um, but yeah, that's that's basically that project. And, and I would say I used these herbs myself for about a year after the show. So it was all still good. I did have to compost some of it, but even what I composted, it's like technically it was used, right? Um, so really just, you know, appreciating what comes from the earth and just enjoying it in as many stages as possible. I think that was kind of the goal of this project. Um, so moving on, um, you know, I just wanted to talk about maybe some more two-dimensional works or works that weren't necessarily gardens or, or something like that. But, you know, now that I move on to this next piece, I see I am growing a plant here. Uh, and this is actually a very special plant to me. It's it's basically a weed and it's called the Asiatic day flower. Um, and it makes this small blue flower. And um, this was growing in my garden and every day I would go out and collect this flower. It, it would come out just for a few hours in the morning time. And every day I would collect the flowers and create this these uh, printed or or finger painting kind of pieces. So, you know, this is like a three foot by four foot um, work on paper and um, it, it's titled Heaven and it has, you know, hundreds or I don't know how many, maybe like a thousand or more of these little uh, flowers just pasted on there. And uh, to me, it was kind of a prayer or a meditative act 
uh, to create this work. So just every day, just, you know, picking maybe 10 or 20 of these flowers and then sticking them to the paper, uh, just pressing them with my thumb just over and over and over. Um, and, uh, you know, to me, that was like a way of, you know, connecting to the garden and connecting with myself. Uh, there is kind of like a Buddhist kind of stamping um, sort of uh, act that is done, you know, in, in certain kinds of, of Buddhism that it was kind of reminding me of. And uh, also just like the blue itself, it, you know, to me, it has this kind of religious or heavenly kind of connotation to it. And just to kind of create this large work just over a long period of time in small increments, uh, you know, it, it had this value to me personally. And I was, I was very interested in creating art that uh, would be enriching and rewarding to me as a person in addition to creating the work itself. Um, so it's actually a light sensitive piece and I had this cover on it uh, at times when it was not viewed. So more recently, you know, I've kind of been making that work off and on for like the past several years. And uh, earlier this year, I kind of created some more works from my current garden. And I, I made three of these 22 by 30 pieces um, that are all like ready to be exhibited at some point. Uh, and, you know, continuing along with that, you know, I've also been just creating dyes from different materials in the garden and just experimenting with them. So in addition to the blue flowers uh, from the Asiatic day flower, this also has uh, like cannabis, uh, which that kind of creates this sort of yellowish tannish color and charcoal that I created as well and forming these kind of compositions uh, on paper from that. Um, so here's like a slightly larger piece kind of following the same sort of process. And these ones, you know, just kind of working on them little by little, avoiding like a really specific composition and just piecing together something, you know, larger from just little actions. Uh, and then just another kind of similar work, you know, this was another piece, you know, made with natural dyes. So I used some different things like, uh, you know, I think there was coffee on here, there was tea, uh, there was cannabis, there was charcoal, all just kind of mixed together. And I think soy as well. Uh, and the, the way I installed it was with these mugwort plants from my garden that I kind of I actually put them into all of the existing holes on this gallery wall instead of actually patching them up. So it kind of like working with whatever the context was in the space. Uh, this, this was kind of like a sculptural work from that same exhibition. And, um, you know, this was kind of made of like all sorts of little pieces of sea glass and broken marble and broken mirrors that I've collected over, um, like, I guess, a couple of years uh, and kind of creating a composition or formation out of them. So in a way, I feel like this kind of relates to those works on paper because it's kind of like building a composition out of these small sort of components over like a a period of time. And, you know, with this, I was kind of just thinking about the life of these materials after, uh, after their intended form and function had been destroyed. But, you know, to me, they had a really beautiful uh, quality and characteristic to them that I wanted to show and arrange. Um, and, you know, with that in mind, you know, I feel like I could talk about these all much longer, but I want to give Kiyomi some time to talk. I know we're all short on that. <laughs> time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, thank you so much. Um, my name is Kiyomi Fukui Nanari. Um, I've been trying to go by Kiyomi Fukui for artist name. Just I, I don't I don't know how to go about it. It's all just complicated. So you might see me listed as both here and there. Um, here you go. I have a printmaking background, as Michael have mentioned. Um, this work and this work was made in uh, grad school. And this was a lithograph uh, attached to a wood, wood panel. And this was something I made probably right after grad school, uh, mono type, mono print kind of a situation. I was taking grass and um, just printing with it, creating something kind of amorphous with it. Um, but as, as he also mentioned, you know, I think uh, I do work with really wide range of um, uh, context for art. And this was a project that I did in 2016 um, at a space called 3307 West Washington Boulevard. That was the address of the space and also the name of the space. Uh, it was an artist run space. 
unfortunately closed down, I believe, pretty recently. Um, it was a very interesting space. Um, the artist who was running the space, her name is Amanda Katz, and she was very much interested in um, yeah, working with all kinds of conceptual art. And so this one was one of them. I was part of her, what, what it was called is um, thought residencies. I was part of her thought residency and I did this thing called tea at 3307. It was basically a weekend long um, tea shop, but nobody spends money on it. Uh, you had to make a reservation. So at the entrance of the space, I would go greet them. And what I had prepared was like a bunch of spice along with three colors of tea. So like you could make blue tea, red tea, and yellow tea. And uh, they were allowed to sort of pick one color from each and then add any sort of spice if they wanted and made their own tea bowl. And I invited them over to the space where we would sit down together and have a conversation. Um, my idea was to collect, collect some stains of conversation and interactions, all sorts of presence, I guess, onto the tea mat. So this was a Saturday and Sunday operation. And each day we would collect um, as the day progressed some more stains and to me it was just so beautiful looking at all these colors and how it interacted with whatever was going on and it was also you know metaphor a gesture to capture that moment um this is amanda and she actually designed that book shelf and worked with a fabricator uh, i got to curate a couple uh i think it was six of those shelves uh for this project uh, this was us looking cute <laughs> at the end of the uh, tea shop experience. And the tea mat was framed up like this. And this was Saturday, this is Sunday kind of a thing. And um, of course, the colors would fade over time. And I think that's part of that, the project. I feel like the fading is also quite beautiful. This was exhibited at the Biola University, curated by Jeff Rao. Um, so a little backwards chronologically, but this was my thesis project. And I really felt like this, um, this is a special one for me. And it's called the Green Thumb Project. It is about grief. It is about the intense emotion of losing someone. Um, and also, you know, how to make it hopeful and how to make it beautiful. That was the idea. And uh, so what happened is that um, I took a mold of my mom's thumb on her deathbed, and I also took a, some mold of mine as well. And both of them, I cast it in paper pulp and embedded some seeds in it. So you would see those like literal green thumb, you know, like sprouts coming out of the thumbs. And it's kind of, for me, it was fun to see both of our thumbs together. The one with a little more uh, thumbnail, more pronounced, longer nail, <laughs> my mom would always kind of get on my case that like oh you haven't trimmed your nails yet and I'm like yeah I just hate trimming my nails <laughs> and uh when I saw my mom's thumb come out of that mold I'm like oh my gosh that is so her hers is a little bit bigger than mine and of course trimmed and and all that stuff but yeah I I made a bunch of those paper sculpture right and uh, I was kind of growing in the gallery I feel like uh I made this sort of like a scientific lab kind of situation in the gallery just growing all these little little plants and whatever containers I could find. And just, yeah, growing it for the duration of the show. And I was also casting the paper thumb in that space and I uh, was giving away uh, here, here, the thumbs to whoever was willing to take care of it. So in a way I was sort of trying to spread her spirit and whatnot. Um, people would bring me gifts too. So there was a little bit of exchange going on. I, I, I think the idea of gifts um, show up often in Michael's work too. And um, at PLP, I feel like that is kind of a big part of it is the idea of gifting. Um, and after the show came down, we planted in our, our friend's backyard um, where he used to live in, uh, whoop, there you go. Uh, so you can kind of see like all the, the thumbs growing into different things. I love this one. You can kind of see the pattern that the roots have made. I feel like that's a print. That's a printmaking right there. Uh, other thing is maybe, you know, because we grew this in such a low light condition, you know, the plants got leggy and kind of formed this really funky, um, almost like a sculpture. Um, all of this to say, you know, it's like 
there's something kind of funny about this too, the green thumb, you know, it's a pun. I'm supposed to, I'm sort of poking fun at it, at, even though, you know, it's it's a sad thing. I, I lost my mom and she's somebody I, who I like dearly, dearly loved. And I still kind of, this was seven, eight years ago. And to this day, it's still, you know, you cannot replace your mom. Um, and I think uh, the idea was that everybody would, we all will lose somebody you love dearly. And um, how do you, how do you make that experience into something you can, you know, hold on to as a hopeful act? And uh, for me, like a little humor there was kind of important. Um, and I did a bunch of iterations of that Green Thumb project too. And um, one of them was at Michael's Fountain as well and uh, we took like the thumb mold kind of grew as a collection and I took a little thumb molds of like little kids at, at a workshop and uh, his thumb mold I took too so there were a lot of different kind of um, forms that it ended up taking and uh, that was also a part of sort of transformation process of grief maybe um, and this one is a, a called apologetic envelope tiny it's like this size very, very small. I made the envelope from a uh, washi paper and I printed it. I am sorry. It is a printed with an ink I made with beet juice and rice starch. So it would fade pretty quickly too, very much biodegradable. And inside of it is a letter, a letter of an apology. Um, I have a lot of unsaid apology. This one definitely specifically about my mom. A lot of things that I wish I had said, I wish I had done and all that stuff. Um, so I wrote that letter of unsaid apology, put that in the envelope and then, uh, put C's along with it. Right. And, uh, that was the idea. And so, uh, you know what, she would show up a little later. I should have ordered it a little differently. Um, but the project was called apologetic garden. So I, this was a uh, project that Michael curated. It was like a big group show and it was in a basement of this place called ice house. Uh, it's like a fish processing plant originally, I think. And the basement is just like kind of like dark and humid, really funky space. And over there, uh, we created this sort of like a shrine-like um, installation and uh, people would be able to write their unsaid apology. You know, So it's a very private act, right? You're not talking to anybody about this. It is just for you um, and planting that that letter there is sort of like an idea of release I guess and a ritual you know like a ritual for yourself really that that letter will not get to anybody but getting to see something alive grow out of it and take on it's sort of like a lush rich life out of your apology I think there's something kind of beautiful about that on its own um and uh that she right here Kelsey that's her name. Uh, Kelsey is an artist. And uh, she actually experienced that work here. And then uh, she reached out to me saying, maybe we can do a collaboration. So we created this project called Reconciliation Vessels. And with that, it was so special to me because we got to curate a bunch of artists, ceramic artists, to create a special vessel for this. Um, so, you know, the first meeting we had, I said, um, please do remember that this is a special vessel that is going to contain and carry uh, people's apologies and regrets and all that stuff. So this is meant to be so, you know, personal and there's all kinds of connotation that comes with it, I think. But uh, uh, for me, I, I did a different iterations of this uh, apologetic gardens too, but I feel like this was one of my most favorites just because of how special those um, vessels came out. and. Yeah, this one was an interesting one uh, made by an artist, Christine, Christine Hudson. Um, they basically ha harvested a clay and it's an unfired vessel. So if anybody here does uh, ceramics, I'm sure you can imagine what would happen when we watered the, the plants in there, right? It would disintegrate and go back to the form of clay. And so th there was an interesting kind of like a process there too. Okay, so what we had was a bunch of seeds and envelopes, um, all that stuff prepared. And uh, you would, well, first we would greet <laughs> and explain to the participants, you know, like what would happen. And they were allowed to kind of go back to the out, uh, back side of the gallery, just space, basically. 
by the way, is called Flux Art Space, such a special space in Long Beach run by an artist, Betsy Laura Hall. Um, just beautiful, beautiful person, beautiful soul and beautiful space really. And uh, so yeah, with that space, you would be able to walk around and have a little private space and have a little moment to yourself writing on your own. And uh, I, I do, I do this myself as well, you know, writing the letter of apology every time uh, we do the apologetic guarding. And honestly, I think every time I do it, it, it hits me quite hard. Um, there's something really emotional about having to write out all these like things that is so hard to say out loud. Um, and yeah, you would come back and then, oh, but by the way, I should mention those little cute spoons that Kelsey had made. So many of them she made. And uh, we actually gave away one per participant. And uh, so they were able to use that spoon to dig up that soil and then plant their letter in there. This is Kelsey and her little spoons right here. Um, I saw May came in. I don't know if she's still here, but there you go. I put put uh, my friend May in here. <laughs> uh, there you go. And this is a close up of um, the apologetic envelope uh, sitting in the soil in a special vessel. Um, moving on to, oh my gosh, time. <laughs> time is running out. Okay, but uh, just real quick, real quick, what I want to talk about is uh, what I've been currently working on researching and just really excited about in general is the idea of materials, uh, what kind of potential uh, materials have, right, is thinking about the memory that seeped in, in this thing that you're holding. Um, this right here is my dear friend, Shihori Nakayama. She herself is a great artist. I want you to look her up because like, oh, she's just amazing and a beautiful soul, you know? And um, she grew up here in the States. Her parents had a farm and uh, all things, you know, a lot of different things happen and then they had to let go of the farm. So like, that's her childhood, right? Like that's her identity. That's her, all her memory kind of like, um, in that space so like before they shut down the farm we visited her and uh we collected everything that we could that we, we thought might be meaningful and um one of them this is actually an avocado grove this is michael picking up all kinds of avocados there and uh that avocado we dyed with and extracted pigments out of that this is uh us collecting rocks from a riverbed yeah and uh, that rocks I ground up into a pigment, earth pigment, and then made a watercolor paint with it. And uh, I've, I've been making little sort of like a meditative pieces with that. Um, other things is that we've been growing our own sort of pigment yielding plants as well. I think cultivating and foraging, that had so much meanings to me. I think there there's a big potential that um, I can kind of like infuse with like sentiment maybe or thinking about like what it was like thousands of, thousands of years ago, you know, like what was there, what was living there, what was going through there, what kind of things have this little rock seen, you know, like all these idea of um, invisible landscape, I think uh, I've, I've been really interested in. These are indigo. I've been using them to extract blue colors and I'm just like, oh, swooning over all the time. Uh, this is a gum, um, gum acacia. It's like a sap from our peach trees and uh, using that as a binder for the watercolor. And uh, another thing I've been really excited about is that I've been teaching myself this thing called mokuhanga. It's a Japanese woodblock printing technique. And um, that is like very special because it allows you to use watercolor as an ink. And there's this kind of like a dance between the elements, you know, moisture, wood, air, all of these things kind of combined together. You can create all these um, prints out of it. So I've been using the mokuhanga uh, techniques to create mono prints sort of like uh, using it as like a drawing tool I guess um and uh yeah that's kind of uh I'm, I'm done <laughs> I'm done let's well, talk about I feel PLP. like you had a lot of cool things to say about like the notion of an in like the landscape I know, like, I know but, oh boy <laughs> we're, we're out of time so we're no, gonna go on to the PLP the past one right I guess okay yeah. <laughs> well anyway yeah um as far as like our collaborative project peace lily press and micro farm goes like that you know that's something that kind of started at the last place that we lived where you know we had a garden there and we would make a lot of art at our house and uh you know 
we would also invite in other artists to collaborate with us. So, you know, doing printmaking, that's a very like collaborative medium. So, you know, a lot of times we'd get some ink all rolled up and maybe a friend or two would come over and we'd, you know, have them carve a block or make a monotype or something like that. And, you know, we're, we're also very much part of like our own artistic community and the Long Beach and Los Angeles area. And so, you know, I think like all of the projects and collaborations and everything that just was very artistic, but fell outside of our own individual art practices. We kind of created this piece, Lily Press and Micro Farm as this sort of like catch-all means of uh, just, you know, platforming all those different projects and things. And that started in like 2014. That's like around the time when I graduated with my master's degree. Uh, and we've just been kind of continuing, you know, slowly but surely. And now it's at the point where, you know, we moved to our current location, um, you know, about uh, like a year and a half ago. Uh, and um, yeah, the, we just so happen to have like this little studio space at our new location that we've kind of turned into a gallery to support our Peace Lily Press and Micro Farm cause. Uh, so yeah, the Peace Lily Press, you know, the, that's like a printmaking press. So a lot of times you might have like a printmaking press, like Crown Point Press or like, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so this is kind of our own thing. And, you know, we've done a lot of printing. Like I print a lot of t-shirts, posters, things like that, but also fine artwork and, you know, collaborating with other artists. Uh, but now, you know, exhibiting and hosting artists to do like more ambitious and involved projects in our garden and in our space. So I think the garden is kind of like, you know, one of the big points of inspiration for us because, you know, we we eat out of our garden practically every day. Like I'm out there, you know, every time I cook a meal, I go out there and I cook or I pick material and I, and I cook it into it. Uh, but also just I go out there to relax. I go out there to unwind. Like every day I make sure to walk at least one loop in the garden and just see what inspires me. And every time I go out into the garden, I'm, I'm getting inspired by different things that I see. And uh, there, were, there actually were already a lot of plants in our garden, like a lot of uh, cactuses, a lot of succulents, a lot of fruit trees, those sorts of things. But we planted it even more densely uh, with uh, like, you know, edible vegetables and herbs as well as native plants. And now it's like kind of like a little lush forest in our backyard. And it just blows me away how much life is back there. Like I'll go out there and, and the garden is just moving with like, <laughs> you know, insects, with birds, with lizards, you know, all kinds of all kinds of creatures. Um, so, you know, it, it's just constant inspiration. There's constantly things growing. And, you know, I'm always just seeing things that are, you know, just fueling the art that, that I'm making. And, and we just wanted to invite more people in on that. So I think our Peace Lily Press and Microfarm project, it is part gallery and part printmaking, but it's also like connecting the garden to that. And, and when, you know, artists come and do projects or when visitors come, you know, we're, we're giving them a little taste of both. Like it's very rare that I bring somebody in to see one of our shows without giving them a tour of the garden first <laughs> or following up the gallery with, the tour of the garden. So to me, they're very much connected and relate very much to each other. Um, but yeah, you know, the first project that we hosted here was by uh, our friend Lucas Chen. And um, I actually went to school with him. He was getting his bachelor's of fine arts and graphic design at the time that I was getting my master's. And, you know, I just happened to kind of know him from the printmaking lab where he he worked really hard. And I just, you know, I didn't even really know him that well. I just enough to like, you know, I guess I followed him on Instagram and just kind of sort of kept in touch with him over the years. And like, I remember I bought some artwork from him because I loved what he did. And then when when we were getting the gears rolling to, you know, hopefully open up this gallery, you know, he, he was the first person who came to mind because, you know, in addition to having a very strong design mindset, He's just an artist who just works in a very wide range of media. And I just thought like, wow, here's this artist who just works in all these different diverse ways. Like, what would he do if we just gave him a space to do like a really cool project in? And that was the basic concept is we just kind of said like, hey, here's our gallery. Like, you know, here's our garden. Like, what do you want to do? <laughs> and he had some of the works for the show started, but I think like uh, getting this opportunity was the impetus for him to really take things to the next level. And I think the the majority of the work, like he really produced 
just in the months leading up to this exhibition. And, you know, big thanks to Lucas because uh, he, he really helped us like clean out and repaint and organize like our, our gallery and also, you know, do a lot of work around our garden to kind of make it better for people to come in. And uh, his show was called Fortune Arrives, um, which, um, you know, is dealing a lot with his cultural heritage and, and how as, you know, a child of immigrants, you know, how does he come to terms with the culture that he's descended from? And, you know, there's some separation and some closeness there. And all of his works were kind of exploring that. Um, there was also an audio component that he created for some of the pieces. That yeah, so beautiful. He did three audio pieces. Two of them were in this gallery. So you would you would put headphones on, you know, for a couple of these pieces, and there would be kind of like, uh, you know, him kind of, kind of saying words, almost like a poem or mm -hmm. or you know another way of engaging the work. So it's you know a couple of these pieces. They're more than just paintings. Like you, you know, you're kind of engaging in exactly what the artist was thinking as he was making the work. Um, so that was a really cool, fun way of exploring the piece. And I, I know a lot of visitors had really profound experiences, uh, you know, through that almost like a guided meditation with the work. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, you know, uh, and, and he had like an awesome community of friends yeah. who he brought with him, you know, uh, for the opening reception and also for some of the projects. So I know for me, like the Peasley Press and Micro Farm, it's, it's been like a really cool way to just connect with more people and to meet really cool people. So like, you know, the artists who we're choosing to work with, you know, they're really awesome, amazing people. And it's been great to like, just get to know, you know, people in their network through this project. Uh, but yeah, Lucas, in addition to the show in the gallery, he also strategically placed artwork all over uh, the garden. And it's almost like a little, uh, how would you say it? Like a little like a scavenger. Uh, scavenger hunt or something, just kind of walking through the gallery, uh, finding his artwork and experiencing it. Um, so, you know, he had, he had a lot of different kinds of work. Uh, it's kind of sprinkled throughout the gallery. And then uh, another one of his friends uh, who, you know, creates music and like ambient sound under the moniker Miroki, Miroki Music, yeah. um, you know, did some like performances for the opening reception. So this was kind of like the singing bowl. Uh, and basically he did like a kind of a meditative like sound sound bath, uh, mm -hmm. which that lasted maybe like 45 minutes or so. Something like that. Which yeah. it was really great. I mean, and it made you so aware of like all the other sounds in our neighborhood. So you'd, <laughs> you'd hear our neighbors doing stuff like over the wall, you'd hear airplanes, you'd hear the train tracks. It, it Like in addition to relaxing you, it just made you hyper aware of just everything that was happening. And, uh, you know, it's just a really interesting way of just experiencing that space. Um, uh, Miroki music. He also did like kind of another performance a little bit later in the evening as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but Lucas did another special uh, project where he he made a like kind of like a fire, and then maybe you can explain this better. Yeah. So that was so throughout the reception day, he was collecting um, in a little box, you know, things that you want to release. So they would like write down, you know, things that they are willing to release. I had a I had a sketchbook <laughs> so it wasn't in the box uh but yeah he would actually burn the whole box um as sort of like a ritual that night and uh for me I I just put my uh, sketchbook in there it was a sketchbook from the time that I was like burning bridges leaving the job <laughs> a sketchbook and I'm like you know what I'm ready to release this so we did that together and that was and, quite interesting. And I should say this Fortune Arrives show, I should have mentioned this right at the start, oh, yeah. but it's actually very much tied to the Lunar New Year celebration. So, you know, he's of Taiwanese descent and it's kind of like, you know, thinking about his family and that connection within the specific time frame of Lunar New Year. So it was it was also based around some of that too. And, and some of like the, the fun and excitement was kind of caught up in the Lunar New Year celebration. Right. Um, which, yeah, I mean, I, there's actually a lot more we could talk about too. Like he even made some prints with us. We did a small edition, uh, <laughs> but, but we want to move on to our next artist. So we, you know, a few months after that, we did, we hosted our second artist, Brianna Miyoko Stanley, uh, which of course, Mirabelle, you know, Brianna, um, and, um, yeah, Brianna, um, she's, she's now teaching at, is it Miramar? 
Yeah. Palomar. Palomar. Palomar College. Yeah. Um, like a community college, mm -hmm. uh, like, you know, south of here. And um, she did a special project with our gallery too. So we invited her in, same thing where it's like, I feel like I had a wish list where I, I wanted her to do like an installation in our space to kind of activate it in, in a new and interesting way, because I think the shape of our gallery is, is pretty interesting and, and she's done paper based installations before. Um, so I encouraged her to do something like that, but really kept it open. And, um, you know, as, as far as inspiration goes, you know, we kind of took her on a tour of our neighborhood. So we live in a part of Long Beach, is west side Long Beach, is west of the LA River. And it's actually kind of an area known as like the diesel death zone or diesel death corridor, because it's right by the port of Long Beach and it's trapped between like the 710 freeway and Alameda which is like a big trucker street that goes up to very LA. Industrial. Uh, so a very industrial kind of place. We're also right by the train tracks. We're right by the gas refineries. So all of the gas that we drive in our cars comes from like, you know, right next door to us basically. So it is kind of like this very polluted neighborhood, this industrial neighborhood, but at the same time, it has like a really uh, uh, special community that lives in it where the people there are just, you know, uh, one one way way of describing them that Brianna came up with was they were plucky. Like, you know, pluck might mean that you're kind of like, you know, you're you're just kind of popping up and you're uh, persisting. There's a uh, resilience there. Resilience, yeah. right? So yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting, like working class community of color that that we live in. And um yeah, you know, kind of really just being interested in celebrating that. And one of the key points of inspiration was there's a Japanese fishing village in San Pedro, right nearby where we live in like the South Bay area. And basically there used to be this fishing village there that, uh, you know, when World War II happened and Japanese inter internment occurred, this was the very start of it where the U.S. government came in and they immediately arrested all of the men, like no warning, just arrested them. And then the women and children had two days to pack up all their stuff and get out. And then basically at that end of that two days, they bulldozed the entire village, completely erasing it. Um, so, you know, in a way, like her project kind of wanted to pay homage to, you know, that community that had essentially been erased off the map, uh, as well as just all the people who are living there, because, you know, it's important that they are, are known and are, you know, we're living like right by where all the industry happens, where, where all of the shipping into our country happens and, and they kind of have to live in this, in, in this area. And, and, you know, I think um, in our, in our area, like people uh, live eight years, eight fewer years than in other areas due to the air pollution and air quality issues. It's one of the worst air pollution locations in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, moving on, that was kind of thinking about our community in that greater context. Uh, she created this painting installation, drawing and painting based installation. And this was one of the walls in the gallery. So like basically just a whole wall occupied with this drawing and painting. And basically we took her on this big tour. <laughs> we took her on this big tour uh, of, of the whole area in our van and, you know, that involved the fishing village, but just driving through like all the streets and just seeing what was happening. And she took a lot of photos and took a lot of notes and kind of combined them all into, into this very large insta installation. So here's just a few more shots of it. Um, you know, in addition to that large kind of mural on the wall, uh, she cut out parts of them and framed them and put them on the gallery wall next to it. Uh, and then there was also a large kind of like ceiling piece, uh, which it was kind of like based off of, you know, plants that were in our garden, as well as like, there's kind of this net material that she created, you know, thinking about the fishing village. Uh, so really just combining all of these elements into this installation, just kind of thinking about this area. Um, so that's kind of what she created there. This is Brianna just basically like tracing the shadows of one of our favorite plants in the garden. It's called the wild daga or lion's tail. And it's basically a weed, uh, it, but it's kind of an amazing plant. It supports all of our local hummingbirds. They love drinking out of these flowers. Uh, but basically she created this work, you know, just, you know, inspired by all of that. Uh, maybe you could talk about these real quick. Yeah, so she also 
I know we don't have any more time, sorry. Uh, but yeah, she made this thing called Norin, which is like a Japanese curtain. Um, and uh, yeah, she created all these like Norin three different ones that she installed in the garden to kind of activate that space. And it's made in a technique called cyanotype. Um, yeah, using that same Fisher fisherman's net sort of uh, structure and the plant materials. Another thing I wanted to kind of mention real quick though is that the, the paper installation that she had had uh, orange on the backside kind of reflecting that beautiful orange light that sort of reminded me of the word pluck I guess there's this kind of like a like a glow to it and there's I was kind of reading it as like a lot of pollution in the air that we're kind of dealing with and a, a lot of things kind of came together in this beautiful way uh with her installation I'm sorry I know we're we're, right, we're done <laughs> <laughs> yeah so uh you yeah, know we also made some prints with her as well so yeah. I think that's been kind of a running theme is just like working with the artists in addition to their project like making some printmaking works with them as well and uh so that leads us to present day and we're kind of working towards like our third artist project, which I think will probably be in early January or something like that. Uh, we might do like a little exhibition with some of our works, maybe around the holidays, no commitments really, because yeah. part of this, we've just been kind of doing you know, what we can, because we're both very busy people and we are part of our goal is like, this can't be detrimental to ourselves. We have to uh, essentially, um, you know, do what's healthy for us and like not push ourselves beyond our means and like burn ourselves out. Uh, so we have been doing this a little slower. I think our goal is probably about like hosting three artists per uh, per year, maybe four if we can do it and not trying to push too much farther beyond that because we have our own art practices and we have full-time jobs. We're, we're pretty busy people in that sort of way. So just doing whatever we can with this project and uh yeah, continuing along in that fashion. Uh, so, you know, with that in mind, uh, we are going to open things up to questions. I know we could just talk about all the details here endlessly, but uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, we wanted to like allow you to ask some questions before Kiyomi has to go back to her class. Um, but yeah, go ahead if, if any of you have any questions or if you just want to hear us blab about stuff. <laughs> 